Hey folks, David Stewart here. It's time for my complete analysis of Solo, a Star Wars story. I did another short review. That one had no spoilers. This one will have spoilers. They are unavoidable when you want to talk about what's really dealing, um, what's really going on in a film on a deep level. So just be aware of that. If you don't want spoilers, if you don't want to know what happens, then you should skip this particular video until you see it. If you want my general thoughts and you didn't see that other one, this is a movie that I enjoyed for what it is, which is a heist movie in Star Wars space. And it, and it kind of functions like Ocean's Eleven. You have this first act that's about um, mostly about assembling the crew to do something that you're going to do. The second act is the beginning of the heist. And the third act is all the twists that happen as a result of that heist. Just a pretty standard uh, three-act format for a heist movie. And I appreciated that. It was kind of cool to see that in a, in a Star Wars setting. However, this movie is also missing a lot of elements that people um, who are familiar with Star Wars are going to miss in terms of a cinematic experience. There's no big battles. There's not lightsaber duels and stuff like that. Um, it's a very different kind of Star Wars movie. So as a result, it may be a little bit underwhelming for some people to see in the theaters, but you can always see it in Blu-ray. And I, I still think it would be interesting to watch on Blu-ray in a nice high definition format where you could see all the details of the sets and what's going on. This movie also contains what is, in my opinion, the most annoying character in the history of Star Wars, which is a droid called L337. Luckily, spoilers right now, she gets killed um, pr pretty quickly after her introduction, and it's a it's a very satisfying death. Uh, so, you know, it's not quite as bad as, say, Jar Jar Binks, who populates the entire movie. With that in mind, let's jump into all the different categories that I like to talk about and just digest what's there. I always talk about production first, partly because... It's good to get it out of the way and acknowledge what is technically going on at the movie. But also, when you're talking about Star Wars, it's really important to talk about production. Uh, in my opinion, Star Wars would not be the franchise it is if that first movie did not have the incredible visual design that it had, as well as the very convincing special effects it had. So if the production quality of the original Star Wars movie had not been at the extremely high level that it was, that it was I don't think there would be a Star Wars franchise. And if you end up talking to fans, they're going to talk a lot about the um, the production elements of the movie and why they like those, the aesthetics of the ships and things like that. So there's a lot that goes into people liking Star Wars, and production is one of the biggest. And if I think from a studio's perspective, production is also one of those things that gives you the safest return on investment. That's why we see these big-budget, super-high-production movies right now is that having a lot of flashing lights tends to tends to at least moderately satisfy a really, really wide audience. Um, so it's important to talk about production. Let's jump into aesthetics. The aesthetics for um, for Solo, I actually ended up really liking. In fact, I'm going to give them a 9 out of 10. And there's a couple reasons that I like them. The first one is there's a lot of different set pieces. We see a lot of different planets and a lot of different conditions, different weather conditions, which we, which we very infrequently see in Star Wars. Lots of different aliens. And this was something that... Really, I noticed a lot about Solo, especially coming after Rogue One and The Last Jedi, which had very few aliens and very few aliens interacting with people. They were very people-centered or human-centered. And this is a fairly human-centered story. All the main characters are human, but there's a large number of aliens that we get to see as well. And I wasn't aware of how few aliens existed in this newer um, Disney Star Wars until I saw this one and there was a lot of different aliens. Aliens I hadn't seen before, especially they have these very strange kind of bug aliens at the beginning of the movie that um, I thought were really, really cool to see and the, the way that they wore suits to protect themselves from the sun and um, the way that they visually portrayed the lore that surrounded these particular aliens was, uh, was really cool to see. And we see aliens as peripheral characters and main characters, including Chewbacca and some other aliens, all the way through the film. And I really, really enjoyed that. I wasn't aware that I was missing it until I saw it again. That was something George Lucas did in all his movies, was try to present you something new in every single movie in terms of aliens or animals, creatures, ships, planets. And this movie continues to present things that are new. And I actually really appreciated that, whether it's the shipbuilding planet Corellia or it's you know, it's the mines um, or it's just their views of space and everything that's going on in there. I really, I really liked the visual design of this movie, and I thought it was a honestly kind of a breath of fresh air after Last Jedi, which was just kind of a um, a reiteration of these classic aesthetics. It looked Last Jedi really looked like 
an original trilogy film in terms of its visual design. And I think that's what a lot of people wanted, but it's not really what I wanted. I kind of like at least some new stuff. And this is this movie is an interquel, and it presents a lot of new stuff while presenting old stuff, and it kind of presents the old stuff in a new way. So we're used to seeing the Millennium Falcon looking a certain way. This is a Millennium Falcon that at least when we see it first in the movie looks very different from the Millennium Falcon that we're used to. And there's a little bit of a explanation of how this really beautiful, pristine ship called the Millennium Falcon that Lando Calrissian really loves, we see why he loves it, how it's attached to his character, and how it just gets kind of wrecked through the movie and turned into the pile of junk that we see in Star Wars 77. Um, and we also understand why Han ends up having this attachment to the ship as, as well as Lando because of this great adventure that they show with the ship. So it's, I think the aesthetics in general were really good. Other people may not, um, may not like them as much because they're very different from uh, what you see, what you've seen before in Star Wars, but that's actually what I appreciated the most, um, as, as well as the variety and the huge number of aliens. So, nine out of ten for those. Now, cinematography and special effects; these were definitely on point, with some exceptions. So, Bradford Young is the primary cinematographer, or, or you know, director of photography. He uses some really modern cinema t- techniques that in some cases were used well like the handheld camera following characters into like a closed corridor towards the beginning of the movie Um, while those tend to work they feel also a little bit out of place in a in a setting heavy um, story like star wars and you tend to want a little bit wider shots a little bit more of that um, that what some people call more a documentary type style where you can see the sets a little bit better. Um, so in, in those cases, the modern cinema techniques tended to work, but in other places, they really, I felt like held back the visuals of the film. So it's pretty much a mixed bag when it comes to the to the cinematography, in my opinion. I'm not a big fan of shaky cam. If you if you know my content, you know I tend to not like it um, because I think it just tends to obs- purposefully obscure what's probably bad action. And in this case, it wasn't always used that way. It was used to kind of create uh, an emotive feel. So I did appreciate its use, um, especially towards the the beginning of the film um, in that case. And the special effects are on point. They look good. There's nothing to complain about them. They're top notch as you would expect most things coming out of... um, coming out of the Disney franchises to actually be in terms of production value. There's lots of new stuff to see with the, the special effects. The... A compositing of the different elements I think was actually done pretty well and if you look at the first act of the movie in particular which is shot on this shipbuilding planet of Corellia that's very dark and very dirty extremely dirty so if you like dirty looking Star Wars you're, you're gonna like that first planet um, where you have elements of CG they're put in a shot that has a very limited set of lighting which tends to hide their seams really well and if you compare some of those scenes with the CG aliens Two CG aliens in, say, the prequel trilogy where everything's really brightly lit and you can really clearly see you can't get that CG quite perfect in the lighting. The lighting's maybe slightly off. It has that weird metallic sheen. Um, it doesn't look like it blends appropriately with its environment. There's there's something off with the intensity of the lighting when it comes to um, these well-lit scenes. But when it's really dark, you tend to miss a lot of that. Likewise, they used a lot of fog and and smoke during battle scenes to obscure the the unreality of the sets, right? So if you have the fog, you have the smoke, people aren't going to notice that the set is, you know, you know, this object may be made of plastic over here. Um, and so that, to me, I thought was a lot of good direction uh, in order to allow your your effects shots to be a little bit more convincing um some people may have a different opinion like well they're just you know they're using that as a crutch well to me it's whatever makes it more convincing and while i'm aware that that's what they're doing um in order to enhance the 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 effect of it um i think it works pretty well and i never felt like they use darkness or use smoke as a way to purposefully obscure the uh, lack of quality with visual effects or anything like that so overall um i do think the special effects were good i would probably give the the whole thing, I guess, an 8 out of 10 because of some of the flaws with the cinematography. Just a couple places where 
I felt like they used the handheld camera inappropriately and a couple places where you did see seams with the with the CGI. So eight out of 10, it holds up with pretty much any other high budget modern movie. And of course it's going to drastically exceed the quality of, um, of movies in the past, even 10 years ago. So you gotta keep that in mind. Sound design, the sound design for this movie, it's good. It lacks, however, some of that extreme punch that you would get from a traditional Star Wars movie, where the engines really have a lot of power through the sound spectrum when they take off, where blasters really explode and really pop. There's just not as much of that strong pop in this movie as there is even in The Last Jedi. The Last Jedi tended to have um, pretty good sound design for all of its uh, horrible story flaws. The sound design was on point and it really like had, had a shocking impact in the, in, the, in the cinema. In this case, the movie didn't feel like overwhelmingly loud the whole time, it didn't feel compressed, but those sound effects didn't have that aural impact that I'm used to hearing in a Star Wars movie. So I guess I'd give the sound design a seven out of 10. Um, lastly, the score, the score by John Powell. It's, a, it's an interesting score. It's highly eclectic, like a John Williams score. It doesn't rely on John Williams' themes really heavily um, the way that the score from Rogue One did. So overall, I like the score. It could have been a little bit better. There's not a lot of themes that I really remember from it, but I remember that there was melody and that there were uh, there was a lot of creative use of orchestration, a lot of creative use of instrumentation. And But again, we have some of this eclectic use where, oh, we're on the desert planet, Here's a sound from the Middle East. Um, we have a lot of that kind of stuff showing up in the in the score, which um, I guess is a little bit corny to me. So score, I'm going to give it, I don't know, I'll give it a 7 out of 10. Um, it's, it's good. It's good enough to be a little bit better than passable, um, but it's not it's not a really good or an excellent score. Um, but I think John Powell did a pretty good job considering he wasn't, uh, he wasn't really relying so heavily on John Williams' themes uh, to produce the score. So there you go. So overall production, about an eight out of 10, um, which is good. You know, that's a good production score. Let's head over into the story. Let's start by talking about the setting. The entire setting of Star Wars is a thing that exists kind of on, on its own. It's its own living, breathing beast. So whenever you're evaluating how a movie displays its setting, when it's a Star Wars movie, you have to think about it in the context of all the other movies at the very least. And in my case, I felt like they, I got this feeling from the setting, the portrayal of the setting, the exposition of the setting, that they were really playing to fans, that they were using, pulling out a lot of details um, to show in the setting that had been alluded to in um, in the original trilogy, because this movie is an interquel. It takes place between the prequels and the original trilogy. And so for that reason, um, I liked the way that they show different planets. I liked the way that they visually explained a lot of stuff that was going on. At the same time, uh, a lot of the fan service I ended up kind of liking. Um, I liked that they were, were dealing with crime syndicates from like the extended universe kind of stuff. Um, and I liked that they... Um, that they really kind of went with that direction instead of trying to um, trying to play really heavily to what we've seen before from the Star Wars setting. I'm not going to give this a, a particular score um, because I don't know. It's it's really hard to give a score for something for something that's been so established for a really long time. One thing that was interesting in particular was this um, making the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. That that's what the main heist ends up explaining is, uh, oh, you know, they made the Kessel Run in a shorter distance, and this is how they did it in a shorter distance. But when you think about it in, cont in context, no one would ever say that I, 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 made the, uh, I made the run from New York to Boston in a shorter distance than anyone else as that like is a special thing. We're usually talking about the speed of the ship. So it's kind of a weird thing to double down on. And um, although in the extended universe, you've had explanations for that for a long time, I've always felt like it's okay to have a writing error and to just kind of say, eh, we just, we said something dumb 40 years ago because we just wanted to explain that the ship was fast and most people um, didn't really get it and it's fine. And then otherwise uh, with the, the setting, they have this, you have this brief little, little bit with this droid L337 where she's on going on and on about like droid freedom and droid rights, which just felt horribly out of place in Star Wars. Um, droids have always been 
you know, somehow not sentient in a way that have required them, you know, anyone to really think deeply about, you know, the fact that we're enslaving droids and putting restrictor bolts on some of them and doing those sorts of things. Um, and if you were going to go that direction, maybe you would, I think it'd be, maybe it'd be okay to do it in a different movie. It's something that's been done in sci-fi for a long time, but um, the space opera of Star Wars, it always seems a little odd to stop and then talk about this complex possible sci-fi um, sci-fi thing in the middle of a, what should be a, an action-packed heist movie space opera type thing. Lastly, they also have the, the plot centering around fuel. So this is the first time they've ever talked about fuel in a Star Wars movie and exposed a little bit of that. Um, I really, to me, the fuel thing just felt like a MacGuffin. You know, it was just something to make the plot function. It's just something valuable that people would want to steal. It could be gold pressed latinum. It could have been anything else. Um, but sometimes you add something like that in and you're not aware of its interaction with the story in general. Uh, we've never talked about fuel sources in, in Star Wars before. And it's, um, it's something that's like, wait a minute, if this is a really serious thing, maybe there needs to be a little bit more talk about it in other movies. Like why haven't we really thought about this before? But anyway, um, I, I kind of just viewed it as a MacGuffin and I didn't take it all that seriously, but it's a little bit odd thing to bring into the setting, just like the droid, uh, the droid revolution characters and dialogue. So the, the characters, you may rate this lower or higher than I am. I'm giving the characters and the dialogue a six out of 10, which to me can be kind of generous depending on the angle that you're taking. This movie is essentially carried by really direct dialogue. That's, um, in most cases, pretty bad in that case. Rather than being subtle, rather than a character saying something and subtly revealing their feelings, they're just kind of saying their feelings. They're just kind of saying what the audience needs to know. They're they're telling the plot as they go. And it's really awkward in some scenes where they're like, you see them cutting between locales while the dialogue is seamless. I really, it's a technique I really don't like. And um, for that reason, to me, that it, the dialogue is is worse and the movie in, in general is worse for it because those things stick out to me. It's like, why would they still be speaking the same sentence across three different locales? I get it if you put it as a voiceover and you show them doing something, but in this case, it's not a voiceover. They're talking in one area, then they're on a different planet continuing the same conversation. That just seems really awkward and um, and stupid to me. Um, so the, the, the dialogue in general was... I don't know, fairly bad. Um, that's uh, surprising having having cast in as a writer who wrote uh, Empire Strikes Back and the, and the dialogue was mostly on point for that. But having recently watched Empire Strikes Back, there's a lot of that direct dialogue in Empire Strikes Back as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I finally get to my analysis of that, um, which is going to be a couple weeks down the road uh, if I'm really on top of my stuff. So uh, it's Star Wars has been full of this kind of hammy dialogue I don't know how objectionable it needs to be. Um, I wasn't that bothered by it, but I was very aware of the fact that they were tended to be telling the plot as they were going. They also used a lot of jargon to escape plot points, which I'll talk about in the, in the plot. Um, the portrayal of Han Solo, I accept it. Most people are not going to like it, and that's because Harrison Ford is so bound up in what we think of as Han Solo that it's really hard to imagine anyone else being Han Solo much less somebody who's going to give you a completely different take on Han Solo. This isn't the, you know, this isn't the really overconfident bad boy from A New Hope. This is a an overconfident, slightly not competent version of, of Han Solo. Uh, he's, he's arrogant and he's always stepping his foot over the line into ways that uh, kind of bite him in the ass. And that may be a portrayal of, of Han Solo people don't like. I accept it because I'm looking at this as this is like a Han Solo origin. The character, he's he's trying to make a name for himself. That's what his main character arc is about in this particular film. He's trying to be, um, he's trying to, to get in with these criminals so he can get money, so he can have his own ship, so he can have freedom. His main thing is to have freedom and to not be not to be stuck on Corellia and stuck in, in some sort of menial um, menial low class existence. That's his main goal. And to me, all the things that he does, all the things that he does, they really, they really go into that. Um, the character's not as smooth. He's not as likable as the as the original Han Solo. But I think he works in the function of this movie. Again, if you're judging this movie for what it is, then these things actually tend to work pretty well together. So I actually liked this 
this portrayal for what it does in this movie as a as a Han Solo as a replacement for the Han Solo we know not really um but you know for for a young Han Solo that's a little bit naive and is learning the ways of the world he's both um not as badass as he thinks he is but he's also more badass than other people think he is and he's able to do um some really incredible things especially towards the end of the movie he shows a lot of shows a lot of growth um you could say some of the same things about Lando Calrissian but um I didn't I didn't notice quite as much with with Donald Glover's portrayal of him it wasn't it wasn't so different that I it bugged me but you know it's the same idea right you have uh, you have Billy D uh, Billy D Williams is Lando Calrissian and anyone else coming in to do him it's going to feel not quite right and that's that's kind of the case with that and you just have to kind of accept it for what it is um there's also some stuff with with Han that I think it is kind of a character arc that George Lucas probably would have approved of. One of the reasons that I think he changed Han Solo from shooting first, shooting Greedo first to shooting second, is because he felt like Han always deep down was a pretty good guy. Um, that he that his facade as his bad boy was a was a facade, and that's part of the the character archetype of the bad boy. And I'll talk about this maybe in another video where I talk just about bad guys um, or bad boys as a type of character archetype because we see him pop up all the time. But one of the main things about a, about a bad boy bad boy archetype is that deep down they're not a bad boy. There's something good about them, and the bad boy is a facade to cover up some vulnerability that they have. And that's what this movie is trying to show is some of that vulnerability. And one of the characters even says directly, "It's like you're trying to you're trying to be you're trying to be this criminal, but deep down, Han, you're the good guy." You know, and that's something that we see in the original trilogy, and it's something that we see in the character arc of this particular movie. It's the way that the the story ends up resolving. Is Han ends up being both a good guy and a badass, and more badass than people are willing to give him credit for. Um, so characters and dialogue are six out of ten. Now, I'm I'm speaking very positively of them, but I'm saying six out of ten might be generous, and that's because of L three three seven. This really annoying droid, We've talked about it in other videos. It's like a caricature of a, of a Tumblr SJW. Incredibly annoying to watch on camera. Maybe next time I watch the movie, which will probably be on Blu-ray months from now, I'll approach it from what some people have suggested is viewing it as a, as a parody. Other people have said you can't parody a parody. It's a parody of itself. However you view it, whether you view it as humorous or just straight up annoying, I don't, I don't like L337 as a character. Um, just every time the, that that character was on screen, um, the droid really bugged me. Everything she said was annoying, except for one genuine laugh that I had, um, where she thought that Lando was like in love with her or something. And that was it was timed like a joke, and I believe it was intended to be a joke. Um, so that really, to me, brings it down. That's like having a Jar Jar Binks in the middle of um, you know one of your. It just be having Jar Jar Binks in the middle of a, of a of a movie that has okay characters. It's gonna it's gonna feel really really bad. Um, so I didn't like that character, but luckily she doesn't have that much screen time. And there was also this moment where they kill her and like the audience, there's people in the audience clapping. And I've only kind of seen that one other time, which was in, um, Braveheart where Longshanks throws his son's possibly gay lover. It's not really explained, throws him out of a window and kills him. And the audience clapped, <laughs> which was like, because he was so annoying, not because he was not because he was gay, but because he was um, a particularly annoying character. Um, so it was one of these things where, uh, the audience sometimes has a better bead on, on how a character is than, um, than the writers do. So, uh, that that's going to drag it down. So overall six out of 10, which is passable. And that's, to me, it's a generous 6 out of 10 because I did end up enjoying the character arc upon Solo. Lastly, plot. So the plot, it's a basic heist movie plot. It's like Ocean's Eleven in space. The first act is about Han kind of getting off of Corellia, getting his way into this criminal crew. Then the transition of the second act is building up, you know, getting the ship and getting the crew together to actually go do this heist because now they're in a position where they must do the heist or they're going to get killed, which is a, a familiar trope from a lot of a lot of heist movies. Then, of course, in the final act, after you successfully do the heist, there's a bunch of twists that prevent you from actually accomplishing your initial goal. You end up having to change goals and there's twists kind of all the way up to the end. Um, and in that case, I, I tended to really enjoy it. There's also some twists in the plot that are kind of on the meta level, where if you know the movies and you know the lore of Star Wars, they set you up to believe that a plot, 
element is going to resolve a certain way, and it actually resolves in the opposite way. And you think that Han's going to, you know, get on the ship and fly away, and he doesn't. Or you know, you think that Han's going to win the Millennium Falcon in a card game, and then he doesn't. Um, there's a there's a bunch of these little things that um, that end up working that way. And I think it makes the story to me uh, more convincing and more interesting from a plot perspective. Uh, th- however, you know the the downside of this is that there's a little bit less heist movie than what I think would be required to really be super interested in a heist movie in space. There's not a, m- a lot of planning. They just gloss over the planning with one of those scenes where they're cutting between different scenes telling you everything you need to know as you go so they just kind of directly tell you here's what you need to know this 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 and this and let's go do it um rather than having a planning phase for the for the heist a kind of a build up to to uh, the stealing of the object or the stealing of the the stuff that you're trying to get like in a traditional heist movie like say the heist or um and uh, you know any any of these other ones that you happen to think of there was one i remember with um edward norton and and um and uh, Robert De Niro that uh, wasn't the heist maybe it was the heist <laughs> or maybe it was the job um, there's like the job the Italian job the heist it, it feels like one of those movies but in Star Wars and some of those twists you know that the twists are going to happen and they, they happen in different ways there's some death of some characters that was unexpected as well along the way that um, was interesting to me that they didn't pull that punch that they let that happen they had characters die in ways that were um meant to have an impact and that was that to me like i don't know that was kind of daring um for them to do usually if a character dies it's because it's it's um uh, you know it's not that important and you know you have random starship fighters get blown up and, and you see them blow up and you you don't get quite as much impact as if you take the time to have them like slowly die um so i appreciated that i haven't seen that in in a while Uh, And I I guess I ended up liking it. So overall, I give the plot an 8 out of 10. And that, to me, was a good plot. It it was very convincing for me. But I like it for what it is. Um, It's not a Star Wars plot. It's really not. It's a a plot that belongs in some other sci-fi movie. And that's probably what makes it feel a little bit awkward um, in terms of how it fits with everything else. It just doesn't really fit in with all of the other Star Wars movies very well at all. And as you're watching the story, you're going to feel like it's it's all everything feels a little bit um, not not quite right. Like this doesn't really feel like a Star Wars movie. Like maybe if this was like part of some TV series or something, it'd feel a little bit better. But that's how it is, and I ended up liking it, um, the plot for what it was. So overall, story seven out of ten. That's a that's a passing score. General effect, I give it a seven out of ten. Um, so seven out of ten general effect. I liked it enough to say, you know, if this is really what you want, you can go see it. Probably should watch it on Blu-ray um, if if it's not absolutely what you want to see, and you're not going to really lose a lot from the experience. Um, I was able to to put aside a lot of my um, a lot of my expectations for what I thought this movie was going to deliver, and actually my expectations were probably pretty low, and I think it exceeded low expectations, which tends to make a movie feel a little bit better maybe than. Um, than if you have high expectations and it fails to meet those expectations. But one of the reasons I like to break down these these categories is because they um, they reveal a lot to me about what a movie is doing well and where it really suffers and by how much it suffers. Uh, so overall, you know, overall score is a seven out of ten. That's a a C, right? So I would give the movie a C uh, C grade. And most of you, I think, if you're you know if you're being honest, it's it's probably not going to be too much higher than a C. Someone, some of you might think it's a B. Some of you might think it's a D. I, there might be people who think it's an F, but I think uh, I think you'd be missing out on a lot of, of what the what the film's actually offering. Um, obviously, it's not done well on its opening weekend, and I think that has a lot to do with the product that it's being that's being presented. It's not a very Star Warsy Star Wars movie, and it's coming only five months after the Last Jedi, which is not particularly particularly well liked by a lot of fans. Um, so it has a lot of things going against it as far as selling to the market, and we might be experiencing a lot of Star Wars fatigue. And if you really want to get people interested in Star Wars, Giving them an interquel that's really very different from what they expect from Star Wars may not be the best idea from a business perspective. Nonetheless, I found it a pretty interesting movie, and so far it's been the one of the Disney movies that I actually enjoyed the most because it was so odd and not like what they were trying to do with the other movies. felt like they were really 
Disneyfying Star Wars and really painting my numbers. And this one didn't quite feel like that. It felt like they took more risks and and ended up coming out as as kind of an interesting product, although a fairly flawed one. And I think you'd agree on that. So thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Of course, you can support me on Patreon by dropping me a dollar if you want. Um, you can buy my books on Amazon. I'm always appreciative of those. The latest series is Needle Ash, um, which I'm quite happy with. And if you join my mailing list, of course, you'll get the first book free. And actually, I think you get the first two books for free. So let me know um, what you think about any of these particular categories down below. And, um, you know... Give me your thoughts. I'll be interested to read them. I may not respond for a while because I'm going to be out of town for a little bit, but I promise I will do my best to read and respond to the comments. I can read them on the go, but I don't do a good job of responding because it's like typing on a phone. It just doesn't do so good for me. So thanks so much for, uh, for watching. You can find my websites, davidvstewart, dbspress.com, and I'll see you guys next time.